Okay, greetings everyone. Welcome to video four, and I'm sorry, five. <laughs> and again, this is a this is video five of a 300 slide PowerPoint presentation. And the topic is the same as our 600 slide PowerPoint presentation: the illegal crackdown on fiance visa fraud by an arrogant, incompetent, and corrupt U.S. federal government. So this video was made actually for the executive branch of the federal government. If you're a uh, reporter, uh, or you know, immigration writer for a national newspaper, you probably um, you could look at this video because it's or uh, the set of these five videos. But you also want the 600 slide PowerPoint presentation because that has all of your references in it. So if you you know if you go through that, we've provided all the references. You know you don't like to print anything without a reference and we have, uh, you know, links to uh, internet sites where we got the reference, reputable sites. So there's nothing in the, uh, this video or, you know, any of our videos or either of our PowerPoints that doesn't have a good reference. But the references in this video basically all come from the uh, C-SPAN video with the uh, U.S. Senate Committee on Immigration, a C-SPAN video uh, entitled fiance visa fraud okay so again this is video five this is the last of five videos for the 300 page presentation so the new topic is a summary so you know naturally since it's going to be a summary part of what's summarizing here is what you just watched in video four <laughs> so we don't want to be repetitive but you know the summary has to include you know one through five and this is going to be a pretty short video so what we have here, the insane indicator system based on the I-129F cannot possibly identify target groups. And how do we know that? We just know that, you know, by video one. So basically the, the government, the federal government, whole of government system, they, they always like to quote the, the whole of government system because they're using all the resources of the federal government, except no, they're not. But um, they like to make you think they are, and they like to they like to make Congress think they are, but they're not. They're not using enough resources. So this is uh, just the I-129F form on the left. This is a uh, you know the form that you use to file fiance visa, and this is uh, page one of six we have on the left. So you know what we have here: the United States Department of Homeland Security slash USCIS. And the Department of State slash U.S. consulates have have a dilemma. You know they they um, you know in assessing fiance visa cases due to their current policies not having any basis in science or best practices. So as con as federal government consultants, we know what be best practices are. Um, as far as the science, not every federal government is going to know the science behind it, but but we do because we we looked up the experts and found. <laughs> You know the best practices in that science and the sciences are statistics and psychology that's what they use here statistics on the form psychology in the interview so here's their dilemma if they approved all fiance visa cases terrorists and other criminals and human trafficking victims would enter the country by the thousands nobody wants that you know nobody wants not you know no u.s citizen petitioners and their fiancés no you know people in the Department of Homeland Security, USCIS, or the Department of State consulates, or ICE. Of course, you know ICE would have a lot more cleanup group, <laughs> cleanup work to do, if everybody got through the country. So we don't want that. Nobody wants that. But the problem is the current insane system that they're using is incapable of identifying target groups, and we're talking almost all target groups, and we'll see what they are in a little bit. So instead of implementing a system that would work, the Department of State denials several hundred fiancé visa cases every year, and the vast majority of those, like you know, 90%, are legitimate couples. And that's just to make it look like the fiancé visa process is not an automatic process. Everybody that applies isn't going to get in the country. That's to scare away bad people. So criminal U.S. citizen petitioners who are looking for a spouse for any of the illicit reasons below, which 
are domestic terrorist attacks on American, Americans, human trafficking, sham marriages, and other forms of fiancé visa fraud. We're just lumping everything else that isn't one of the top three into one group of other forms. So, but the majority of it is, you know, sham marriages and human trafficking. Uh, so far, we haven't had too many terrorists get into the country that we know of. Um, we only know that there are terrorists when they start killing Americans. So how, at the bottom, the insane indicator system, based mostly on the information on the I-129F, cannot possibly identify these target groups. Why? Because the target groups, you know, they're over 12 years old, and they can beat the system. Any 12-year-old, any 5-year-old could beat the system. It's that easy to beat the system because it's just insane. It's also insane that these people that you saw in video one to introduce themselves and, you know, say, hey, I'm from the Department of Homeland Security, or I'm from the, uh, you know, the uh, U.S. processing centers. We have, you know, 3,600 people working for us, and we have 1,800 consultants. So what are the 1,800 consultants doing? That's what I want to know. Are they hiring just independent consultants that have no experience in the government? You know, how do you have a ratio of one consultant to every two employees, and you have a sham like this, like this uh, fiancé visa system? I just don't understand that. Okay, so what we're going to look here, look at here, is like a, uh, you know, uh, graphic representation of, of, you know, the way we see the system. So we're going to look at this from two different viewpoints. On the left, we're going to have sane, educating, law-abiding American citizen, law-abiding American citizens. That's, you know, like most of us, you know, 330 million of us. And on the right, we have the whole of government viewpoint which, you know, keep in mind, and we we keep saying this, and, you know, if you watch videos one, two, three, and four, you would not be offended, but we call the government, you know, arrogant, incompetent, and corrupt, and that's what they are, and you know, we have plenty of examples of them being corrupt and arrogant and incompetent in, in the first few videos, especially video number one and number two. So this is, uh, you know, just keep in mind, you know, Americans on the left, government on the right. So on the left, you know, Americans might look at this room and think, yeah, we have a bunch of clergy here. And uh, looks like, uh, you know, looks like, you know, I, I don't know if it's Catholic Church. I don't know that much about the Catholic Church. But, you know, the guy in the middle could be like a bishop, you know, could be a pretty high up guy in the Catholic Church. And then we have a bunch of clergy that are, you know, not bishops, you know, priests. And then there's a guy on the left, and the guy on the left is, you know, dressed in black, wearing sandals. He's holding up an AK-47. He's got an ISIS flag. You know, we might think as Americans, because we're over 12, we might think that guy is a terrorist, okay? But the way the government sees it is on the right. They see only I-129F packets with low indicators and high indicators, that's all they see, low and zero indicators and high indicators. And as we saw before, it's easy for criminals to beat the system. They avoid indicators. You'll see that in video number one and video number two. Anybody who's a criminal can beat the system. And if they don't know how to beat the system, ask a 12-year-old. Okay, so like I just said, this is the viewpoint of most Americans on the left, government on the right. So we see a room of clergy and, you know, an ISIS looking dude dressed in black holding an AK-47 and an ISIS flag. They see just cases, you know, with low indicators and high indicators. And, you know, there are supposed to be indicators here of, you know, alerts to the national security. But so far, you know, terrorists haven't alerted any national security indicators. Because why? Because, you know, terrorists are... You know, they asked a 12-year-old, hey, how do I get in the United States to kill people? And a 12-year-old said, oh, that's easy. So we would easily be able to spot the terrorists. The government can't. The way the government looks at it is the cases with low indicators, um, they, you know, these, these indicators accumulate as you go through, you know, the processing, the, the process, the I-129F process. And, you know, the, in the case of the San Bernardino terrorists, uh, the uh, 
the American citizen petitioner who wanted a gun-toting um, ISIS bride so he could have her hold another automatic weapon and they can kill twice as many people. He just went up to some site, you know, called, you know, uh, ISIS uh, gun toting brides dot com, you know, or something like that. You know, he, he easily went and found her on some kind of Internet site because they never met. OK, the senators bring this up in the meeting, but the senators are they're almost like the 12 year olds. So. You know, he looked for a wife who was born, you know, 330 some days apart, I think it was. I don't remember. It's in video two, I think. So the idea when you're when you're a criminal and you're picking out somebody that you want to get that you want to beat the system, you avoid indicators, you avoid big differences in things like education, age, religion, um, you know, income maybe. You know, all of these indicators that they have on the I-129F, and that's covered in, uh, uh, I think, uh, video number one. You know, criminals know how to avoid that kind of stuff. Where Americans who, you know, go overseas, maybe they're, you know, going overseas to, maybe, maybe they're young and they're, going, they're doing their undergraduate degree overseas. Or maybe they're in graduate school overseas. Or maybe, you know, Americans just go on vacation. They you know, go into a museum or something and, you know, meet somebody who's a potential fiance and start talking to them. You know, people in loving and legitimate relationships don't don't worry about things like, oh, what? No, no, we, I can't talk to you. You're more than two years age different than me. You know, what? that'd never work. You know, Americans don't think like that. American citizen petitioners. Criminals do. Why? Because criminals are criminals. They don't want to get caught. It's like, you know, being a bank robber. You know, you, you go in there wearing a mask and carrying a gun because you don't want people to know who you are. Well, it's the same with these criminals. You know, the uh, the law firms that run these sham marriages, they don't want to get caught. They know, they know they'll go to prison. You know, so they, they match up Americans to people overseas who will pay for a citizenship. That's what we call sham marriage. Um. And the the lawyer, the law firm, or fake law firm, <laughs> if they don't know what they're doing, they ask a 12 year old, and 12 year old says, "Oh yeah, just just find somebody with, you know, with no indicators, because the more indicators you accumulate, the better the chance you're going to get your visa denied in the interview." And the government might, argue, might, you know, the government might argue with us, but we're smarter than them. We can prove it. So what we see, you know, is we see that the uh, the terrorists just slip right through the system because why? Because he's one of those groups of people who avoid indicators. And the the, the clergy on the right that just happen to be, you know, these are guys here, so we'll assume that since they're clergy, they're probably marrying a female. So the the American female citizen petitioner who, you know, put in a, a I one twenty nine F I one twenty nine F to marry one of these guys. Um, you know, they had some high indicators there. Why? Because because they're real people. Real people have indicators. So what happens here is, you know, you get a big green check mark on the ISIS terrorists. Come on in, you know, come on into America. We're we're stupid, we can't catch you. And the two people on the right just uh they both have eye indicators. They're they're approved by the USCIS because they meet all the requirements. But heading into the interview, they have a lot of indicators. And if you have high indicators going into the interview, you just might get denied. So here I just have a little graphic. You know, one of these guys got approved. He's probably happily married now to an American citizen. And the other guy got denied. So why did he get denied? Because it was his turn. Because like I said before, they can't approve everybody. If, they, if the USCIS... You know, the, the Department of Homeland Security slash USCIS approved everybody. They just about do approve everybody. Um, but if the Department of State slash U.S. consulates, if they approved everybody, we'd have everybody approved. So they have to deny some people. They have to deny some people to A, make it look like they're working, B, fake out Congress, and C, they don't want a 100% approval rate because Everybody that's a criminal would come into this country thinking, you can't stop us. We're just coming in. You know, there's no there's no chance of getting caught. So we're just going to line up, find American citizens that will sponsor us as a, you know, as a spouse. And we're going to 
you know, get a bunch of AK-47s and kill Americans because that's what that's what these uh, pathetic people do. So, like I say here, since the U.S. consulates do not have any legitimate fiancé visa denials, you know, you can't. How do you deny somebody if they have a difference in age, or if they have a difference in income, or if they have a difference in something? How how do you how do you say? You know, that that's not a legitimate relationship or the way they like to say it, that's not a bona fide relationship. That's that's lingo from the government. Um, but they, you know, they say they don't have a denial quota, but they do because every year it's about 2%. So is that a quota or is that just a coincidence that every year it's about 2%? Well, it's not a quota because there's no official quota, but they can't deny, they can't approve everyone. So they deny about 600 to 700 cases per year and the vast majority of those cases are people like you and your fiance. So as a result of, of a reliance on this insane system, terrorists, victims of human trafficking, uh, fiancés in illegal sham marriages for profit and other criminal groups easily pass through the system and get into the United States. And that's because of massive corruption, you know, there's, you know, the, I forget what, I think there's a couple different videos that show the actual law, the I, I'm sorry, the INA, Immigration and Nationalization Act. I think it's section 104 and it says the Department of State, no, not the Department of State, the Secretary of State has the responsibility of defining all the policies and procedures that are to be carried out in this whole process and has this final decisions and everything except when your fiance goes in for an interview. Then it's up to the consulate officer. The consulate officer has the final say. So the consulate officer, if he comes into work pissed off and he hasn't denied anybody this month and he knows he can't approve everybody, then you know your fiance's in deep doo doo. So it's all up to this guy. This is a guy named David Donahue. Now the Secretary of State is not David Donahue, but you know the, the Secretary of State basically appointed this principal deputy Secretary of State. He's in charge of all these policies and procedures, and you know we'll go over some of them. So the indicators, you know, not only are they crazy, they have no validity. You know, so here they have no validity to academic professionals in the field of statistics. Now I, you know, I. It's been a while since I had my MBA, and I, I kind of thought I remembered statistics correctly, but I didn't. <laughs> so I had a couple of uh, university professors who I sent stuff to. I said, "Hey, look, this is the I-129F. It's a, it's a six-page form with a bunch of fields on it." And, uh, you know, I I wanted to get back feedback and say, you know, what what basis in science do these guys have of denying cases? Uh, with a lot of indicators when criminals tend to avoid the indicators and you know they all n nobody argued with me but the way I the way I worded that originally needed to be changed because because I was just you know not remembering things right <laughs> so what's written in the presentation now and in video whatever video three I think is uh, correct video two I think um, so that is, that's because I was straightened out. I was schooled by a college professor in a prestigious United States university. So in other words, the, the government statistics, use of statistics in the I-129F have no validity, has, has no basis in the field of statistics. You can't do that. You can't, you know, you can't pretend like you're looking to find a, a target population that avoids indicators and apply these indicators on the entire population and think you're going to get the target group. No, you're not. You're going to get people at the fringes of, you know, the normal group. And in video two or three or whatever it was, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I went over this in great detail. We use age indicator as an example because it's age indicator is an easy number to use. So the you know the result of this, the terrorist comes flying into the country, and and also here, the interview has no validity according to both academic professionals and non-academic professionals, you know, uh, psychology professionals in in uh, basically an in industry in the United States associations for psychology. There's a couple of them that we went to. 
So the interview process, and you'll see that in video one, it has no basis in the field of psychology. And all of the people that we asked had the same reply. It has no basis in the field of psychology. These entry-level consulate officers who are no doubt lower ranked than you are. I mean, the, the person, the American citizen petitioner filing for a visa, I mean, granted, there's a lot of college kids that meet college fiancés overseas, and they might need their mother and father to, to sponsor it because they don't have enough income to bring a fiancé over to the United States to get married. But, you know, m the vast majority of people that apply for these I-129 visas are not college kids. You know, they're they're older people, they're, you know, in graduate school or they're, um, you know, they're overseas on business or they're vacationing, but they tend to be higher than entry-level people. So an entry-level person is the one that's going to say, hey, you got a lot of indicators here, I'm not really in a good mood this morning, I don't like the looks of your fiance because she's hot and my wife is not, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to deny her or him, you know, whatever the case may be. So we're going to take a look at the uh, mastermind, I call him. You, you know, not Donahue, you know, he might have inherited all this stuff, but that's no excuse. You know, he's a federal government guy. He should know what he's doing. If he doesn't know what he's doing, he should ask a consultant. And if the consultant doesn't know what they're doing, they should go back to their, you know, global consulting firm and say, hey, I need an answer to this issue. You know, ask our law firm. So I give uh, hundreds of reasons for why this guy's corrupt, um, but one of the, the uh, tactics here um, is to use an interview that is mandated by the NAA as a farce. You know, if you go through video number one and you take a look at the interview questions, it's like, you know, how, how old are you? How old's your fiance? How old? You know, how long have you known each other? How did you meet? Um, do you know what he does for a living? Okay, you're approved. Same questions, and maybe not as many. We have we have plenty of them that are examples where there are only three questions asked. So three or four questions, you know, approved, three or four questions denied. We had psychology professionals take a look at these quotes, and where did the quotes come from? They came from fiancés who went through the process. So if you're a fiancé, or if you're a U.S. citizen petitioner, think about your fiancé. He or she is going to go into an interview, and be asked three or four questions. Do you think maybe if they asked 20 questions, they wouldn't be able to remember them? But if they ask three or four, you know, they can write them down. They can write them down during the interview. They can take notes during the interview. Um, they can uh, just remember three or four questions. So these people that go into the interview, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of social media out there. There's, uh, you know, fiance visa forums as well as any other kind of visa forums. Forum is what I'm saying. I sound that kind of quick. Um, there's, you know, social media, like by the, by the scads, you know, like Facebook and Twitter and all this kind of stuff where people actually, you know, it, you know, they're getting all excited because they're, they're engaged to somebody overseas. They want all their friends to keep up on them. And, um, you know, they post stuff every day and they post the questions up there. So you can, you can take all of the quotes that I have up there and look them up. They are copied from a forum or from some kind of social media site verbatim. They're copied word for word and pasted into that presentation. I didn't make anything up. Because why? Because I'm a consultant. I don't make things up. So this is talking about the um, the interview. The consular officers look at the, you know, they never look at the evidence of a bona fide relationship. They call it secondary information, but you know what's crazy about this is when you apply for your fiance, fiance visa and when you send your packet in, you're looking at seven or eight months or nine months until your fiance gets the interview. Okay, if you have to prove in the packet that you have an ongoing relationship, then you know it's just a given that everybody that goes to an interview brings in proof of an ongoing relationship since you filed because you know, you want to show the government that, hey, you know, not only were we a bona fide couple back then when we filed, we still talk every day. We still have video chats every day. We still, you know, you might send packages to your fiance overseas or he or she might send packages back. So, you know, you, you keep all this stuff as evidence and say, look, here's 200 pages that show that we are still, you know, what we used to be when we were together. 
So again, both PhDs in academia and in the field of psychology and in professional organizations say that there is no validity at all in the field of psychology for the interview. The government can argue what all, you know, all they want. We have the proof. So here's another corrupt tactic that they use. Um, oh yeah, this is cool. So, you know, the second tactic is uh, that they, they deny a, a visa and they don't tell you why, you know, because if, because they know that they, they deny a visa, you're probably a legitimate couple, but it's your fault because you didn't prove that you have a bona fide relationship. That's the way the government looks at it. And, you know, that's just crazy. But, you know, that's what they use as an excuse to deny you. And, of course, they're not going to tell you the reason why. Well, you know, one of the uh, denials was I didn't see, you know, the, the consular officer said this. I didn't see a picture of the, the fiancé with, with the U.S. citizen petitioner's mother. So I'm denying you. I don't think you're real because there's no picture of you with the mother. Insane stuff like this that we have proof of and we showed to psychologists who destroyed this whole interview process. So this is one thing. They, they just don't tell you the reason for denial. Because why? Because if they told you the reason, you might be able to challenge it and say, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Here's all kinds of pictures of, you know, my fiance with my mother. But if they don't tell you the reason, you can't argue. That's corrupt as hell. This guy, you know, I don't think he should be, you know, terminated. That'd be too easy. I think he should be shot. <laughs> He's putting the United States in a grave, you know, national security risk because he's pretending. So here's another tactic. Uh, what is this? <laughs> it's been a while since I made some of these slides. So a third corrupt tactic used by Donahue was not to follow the policies. Okay, like if you look on the left, you see INA section 221. I kind of covered up G, but you can see it down on the bottom there, 221G. After submitting the documentation, your visa application can be processed at the conclusion to determine whether you qualify for a visa. You have one year from the date you were refused on a 221G to supply the information that you're missing. On the right, this is from somebody, I don't know where it is, um, but this came from a, uh, a U.S. consulate office from the uh, chief of the consular section, and it came addressed to a United States senator. So in other words, the United States citizen got denied, went to their senator, and the senator said, why are you denied? They said 221G, but but they're not going to wait a year. <laughs> they're not going to tell you what's wrong. They're going to just return your, your packet to the USCIS. You know, there's no waiting for what's missing. You know, because why? Because corruption because this guy here allows this stuff to happen he, like i said he he should be taken out you know against you know i i know where he works i know the building because i worked right across the street from him in the gsa building uh, you know he should be just taken out in front of his building and they should like give a gun to every you know um, u.s citizen petitioner and their fiance whose lives he screwed up by denying them give him a high-powered rifle and just blow his head to bits that's that's what should happen here so what is this? This is another a fourth corrupt tactic used by Donahue. Oh yeah, he, he holds on to the denied packet. Okay, technically what they should do if they deny a packet, they should it it it's like this. The USCIS, once they approve your packet, if you're a US citizen petitioner, um, or if you're you know somebody in the executive branch that just wants to know how this happens, once they you know it takes about, you know, five months to get the 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 i-129f packet approved by the uscis once that's done it's sent to the national visas processing center and they just print out a visa and they you know they enter it into the database and then they enter you know your um, passport number and your fiance's passport number into a database and then they print out the they print out their visa and they they ship it you know overseas to your consulate office so the consulate office gets it. This this only takes like at most 10 days. You know, from the U, from the time the USCIS approves it, they give it to the visa center. The visa center maybe takes three or four days to process it, and then another four or five days to ship it overseas somewhere. And they have it within 10 days. So that's how fast it can happen. But once your visa is denied, they have this little trick. You know, if you deny a visa, and if they send it back to the USCIS, 
and the validity period was still um, still current, then the USCIS would say, hey, you know, nothing's changed here. We approved them the first time. We're going to approve them again, and they'll send it back to the consulate. Consulate doesn't want to see it a second time. But why? Because they're corrupt. So what they do is they hold on to it for like, you know, they deny your visa, and then they hold on to it for four or five months to make sure the validity period is expired. And whose fault is this? Donahue again. Because why? Because Donahue is in charge of all the policies and procedures. You know, he's in charge of everything except for the final decision of the consulate officer. But his policies and procedures guide the consulate officer. If you, if you know, if you're a terrorist or a criminal, you have no indicators. Then the, the consulate officer really has no reason to suspect you of anything, and they just approve the case. But if you're real and you have a bunch of indicators. They're going to deny your case. They're going to sit on it for four, four or five months and give it back to the USCIS, who will sit on it for another year. And that's supposed to make you think again about applying for a visa. Another thing he did, you know, the, the Senate here, senators are not exactly the sharpest tools in the shed. You know, they're, they're all playing this bipartisan stuff. That's all they do all day is like, you know, self-promotion, join forces with other people that, uh, you know, can get them votes because they're, you know, they're uh, sponsoring some kind of uh, bill. You know, they, you know, they want their name on, you know, 100 bills while they're, they're while they're in service in, in term. Um, but the problem was this this crazy meeting that they held this, you know, this is the Senate Committee on Immigration. These are major players here. You have upper left Feinstein, Grassley in the middle, who's the chair. And then you have Durbin. So Durbin and Grassley, you know, introduced, started up this meeting and then they left. <laughs> and then Feinstein came in late and left early, but she did address the uh, San Bernardino uh, massacre and she did address the uh, sham marriages and human trafficking also. So she got a few points made. Then Tillis and Cruz came in at the end. You know, so no, no senator, this is almost like a trial. You know, this is, this is the jury. The senators are the people that summoned in the leadership team of the USCIS, Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of State and Consulate. So we had leadership team. We had five guys that were from both of those areas and one, one ice guy, one ice guy, not one nice guy. So, um, you know, Donahue, he, he misre he's misrepresented the status of all this to, to the Senate. I mean, they come in and they swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and they just ask, ask, answer specific questions. But the truth is they can't possibly identify any target groups, and they lead the Senate to believe that they can. And, you know, we're professionals. We watch this. I, I have this C-SPAN video memorized. I've watched it at least 10 times, you know. Three, you know, like four or five times from, from beginning to end, and it's two hours long. So, you know, I, I see a smoke and mirrors act. I know you guys are just, you're trying to scam the U.S. Senate. And you did it because it's easy to do it because they weren't all there. You know, they weren't, you know, when Tillis and Cruz come in at the end, they're asking the same questions that Feinstein asked because they, they didn't see the beginning of the movie or movie, the, uh, you know, the meeting. So anyways, that's corrupt too. When you, when you don't tell the whole truth, when you, when you don't tell the Senate, we're not doing a very good job of catching target groups and we admit it and we need more help. That would be the truth. They don't say that, which is what? That's corruption too. Another reason to take them out back and shoot them. So here what we have is a little graphic I made. You know, we have the circle of insanity that I went over, I think, in video four. And to, to get the circle of insanity working, what you need is just a crazy indicator system, a crazy consulate interview thing. Senators that are indifferent, that don't care whether you get passed or denied. If, if senators would take the effort and challenge every denied fiancé visa, then the Department of State wouldn't have any denials. And what would happen? They'd have to, you know, they'd have a meeting and say, God, senators are starting to challenge us and, you know, telling us that the couple's legitimate. Now we're going to have to look for the real target groups. My God, what are we going to do? We, you know, I might lose my tea times if I have to, you know, work on stuff like that. So anyways, this graphic shows that terrorists, sham marriages, human trafficking victims, and internal boo-boos, like 858 immigrants here that were wrongly granted citizenship, these kind of people can get into the country with ease. 
the people that can't get into the country, well, you have to deny somebody. So who do they deny? Take a guess. You know, your fiance. So that's the end of this topic, and that's the end of these videos. And uh, if you want to know more than what we cover here, then there's a lot in the 600-page presentation. So if you go to our site, I'll have our site posted on YouTube. And uh, this video here is a lot longer than I thought it would be just for a summary. <laughs> but some people might just watch the summary. That's why I wanted to be a little thorough here. So we appreciate your time. Um, you can join us. We have a site. We'll have links to the site. Um, we have pretty good numbers now. We've got a couple hundred, you know, uh, U.S. citizen petitioners and fiancés. We, we could, we'll always welcome more. We want all of you. Um, also, we're we're going for the throats of these people. We feel that uh, you know U.S. citizen petitioners and their fiancés, you know, if, if you were denied, say, five years ago, and then you spent the next two years traveling back and forth, you know, somewhere across the world. You've got flight expenses and dinner expenses and hotel expenses. You have legal expenses. Maybe you called a law firm who tried to help you because you were denied, you know. And then you have loss of income from your spouse for every year that your spouse wasn't, I'm sorry, your fiancé. Yeah, you have loss of income from a spouse, spousal income for, you know, so... You know, 50000 a year for a few years. You know, if you go back to like we did an audit on uh, 2015, and the way look, we look at it is the Department of State owns everybody who was denied in 2015 $74 million, and that's for one year. We haven't done the audits on 2016 or 2017, or we haven't gone back in the past yet. But when these guys deny you, they, you know, they put, they devastate your lives because, you know, you're not going to get married to your fiance now. They're going to make life miserable on you. And you're also going to suffer financial hardships. So we want to take this money from these guys, you know, from these idiots that, that do this stuff. And we want to redistribute this money among the people's lives that they screwed up, you know. And, you know, I don't get anything out of it. And I don't deserve any kind of compensation. But I want to see people get compensated whose lives were devastated by this corrupt and insane, arrogant, corrupt and incompetent U.S. federal government. I just don't understand how a consulting, you know, any consultants can allow them to operate like that. I'm not involved in this process now, and I'm the whistleblower. So I'm protected a little bit by whistleblowing, you know, laws. But, you know, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to get you people compensated for your troubles. All right, so that's the end of this. If you um, watched all, if you didn't watch all five videos, I would watch all five videos. If you want to see the big presentation, you have to go up to our site. I appreciate your time, and good luck in the future.